Hello everyone, my name is Sierra Santi, and today we are going to be talking about Disney's Fantasia. We're going to talk about the music that was used, um, how it was representative, and if it kind of enhances what they were talking about or what they were trying to show in the movie, or if it kind of distracts from what they were trying to teach. Uh, just to give a little bit of a background, uh, Fantasia was made in the 1940s. And the premise of it was to kind of show children that music is more than just, or like classical per se, is more than just instruments playing noise, that it's a feeling and it kind of, and it's showing like, it can have a story behind it. It doesn't just have to be uh, notes flying around a room, that there can be something to go with it. It didn't do well in theaters, but uh, I grew up with it. I love it. So without further ado, let's get into all of the songs that are in Fantasia. The first song that we are introduced with is Toccata and Fugue in D minor by Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, this song was actually created during the Baroque period. I've spoken about it in a different video. And it kind of starts by showing silhouettes of the orchestra players as they're starting the song out and then later it fades into um, abstract images of like clouds and landscapes um to me personally this kind of distracts from the point especially with being aimed towards children uh I'm sure a lot of children were confused by seeing just shapes of people playing instruments. Uh, it doesn't really show what the story is trying to say. I appreciate the abstract images after a while, then it's like it's trying to, but I really do think it just distracts from what the movie is trying to portray. And I don't think a lot of them is really distracting, but I will definitely get into the ones that I find it to be very distracting to children. So the second one is a number of pieces from the Nutcracker Suite by Tchaikovsky, which the Nutcracker Suite was made in the classical era. Everyone knows the Nutcracker or the ballet. And so they took a lot of the pieces from that and did different animations during the second half. And the first song that they start off with is Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy, very famous. And for like the background picture, they did a bunch of fairies like flying around spreading dust or magic on everything. And this is probably a really good idea of how it enhances, because obviously you hear dance of the sugar plum fairy, you think fairies dancing around. And the way that they portray it, instead of like in a ballet sense, is they show actual little fairies like going around doing little dances and like I said, like spreading dust on stuff. I'm not really sure what that was, but, but I think that is a very good representation of what Disney was trying to explain. That it's not just the music, it doesn't need to have words, that it's more of what you can imagine in your mind while listening to it. The next piece that we are shown during the Nutcracker Suite is the Chinese dance, which is just these cute little dancing mushrooms uh, dancing around, and it's a little racist looking back at it, which might be a little bit of a distraction, especially if you if you catch it, I, arguably when I was younger I did not catch that, but uh, going back it's a little racist and that's distracting. But it also does enhance because you do get, like I said, that visual, but in a fun and whimsical sense. And next we have Dance of the Reed Flutes, which um, as it shows a bunch of flowers like dancing on a lake it seems like or maybe like a river and they kind of like fall off of a waterfall <laughs> um and honestly it, it 
exactly as it says. Um, it's a dance of the reed flutes. And you just see these flowers kind of twirling and it really is very beautiful. And I feel that it does enhance, again, what they are trying to say. And next is Arabian Dance, which is kind of an underwater take. Like we fall off the waterfall and now we're in the water. And we watch fish swim in time with the music. So in that aspect, I would say that it's enhanced, but at the same time, like as a kid, in a kid's standpoint, like I was saying, at that point is when I kind of like fall off. Like the kid's kind of like, okay, we're, it's a little slower now. We're not going to pay that much attention to what's going on. But at the same time, it's showing, it definitely shows what, Fantasia is trying to say like if you think of this dance you think of like simple movements and what better to um, illustrate simple movements than a fish <laughs> next is the Russian dance and I'm just gonna say it, it it's it enhances it, it shows what they're trying to say uh, in this thistles and orchids are doing the Russian dance we all know it and it's easy to visualize so that one was fairly simple <laughs> and the last one they do is waltz of the flower which coincidentally is not being performed by flowers the fairies actually return and turn start turning uh like spring into summer summer into fall and they end with fall turning into winter and overall, I think they did a really good job with tying in what we see when we think of the Nutcracker Suite, despite it not even being about the Nutcracker, like thinking individually what each song could represent. And I think they did a really good job with that section. Next is The Sorcerer's Apprentice, which is by Paul Dukas and it was around the romantic era of music. And they took this and did their own little animated short with it. So the Sorcerer Yen said, which another fun fact is just Disney spelled backwards is the name of the wizard. Uh, he leaves his magical wizard hat behind and I assume he goes to bed. And Mickey who is grabbing water for the uh, Yen said, sees the hat and thinks, you know what, that'd be pretty fun to do. So he puts on the hat, makes sentient brooms to do his job for him, and it kind of just goes out of hand, and long story short, they end up flooding poor Yen said's basement. <laughs> um, but I, this really, it, it's a really good it definitely does what it, or tells what is going on. The music really goes with what is being shown on the screen and it's perfect for children. Like children would actually get engaged with that one for sure. And the music itself, it really does go along with what is being shown on the screen. Like when he points, you hear the symbols clashing, you know, it's a really good representation that one is. Next, they did Rite of Spring by Stravinsky. Uh, this was during the modernism era of music. And all that this section is, it just tells the story of life being created and the rise and fall of the dinosaurs. Uh, I can see that one kind of being a little um distracting or not as great i mean the music is good it's just not not exciting and you and it doesn't quite go with what is being shown now i'm happy they didn't go with what it actually right of spring happens I talk about that in my modernism video, but um, it really, it kind of drags on a little bit. 
and the music doesn't necessarily go with what is being depicted. And I'm sure they lost a lot of children there. <laughs> uh, if they didn't lose them with the beginning, they lost them there. I'm sure of it. Sometimes I even find myself skipping <laughs> the Rite of Spring, even though I love that song so much. The next they go into is called Symphony Number no. 6, Pastoral um, OP 68. <laughs> That's a name, and it's by Beethoven. And they go through three different stages with this one, and it all tells a story. So it really, it's like a jump from what we were just in with Rite of Spring. So the first little bit is Allegro Manon Troppo, I think is what it's called. And this is where we see a bunch of unicorns, little baby unicorns, other creatures, uh, a centaur maybe, I'm not sure what they're called. And they're playing around underneath of Mount Olympus. And really, we're following like this little baby unicorn playing with his siblings and his mom and his dad. And really, the music, it does go with what you're seeing on the screen. And I think after <laughs> Rite of Spring, that's really what will bring back the children from what they were witnessing. Uh, but basically, that's just all it is, is unicorns dancing around to this part of the classical piece. And then next, it switches over to Adante Maltomoso. Uh, the horse people centaurs maybe i i don't i can't remember the names but uh they match with their partners and are getting ready to celebrate bacchus which is the god of wine the music really goes with what we're seeing especially with it being like this greek whole story being based on this whole piece by beethoven and then lastly, they do Allegro 4, Allegro 5, Allegretto. I think that's how you say it. Um, and in this, we get to see Bacchus, and we're celebrating him until Zeus kind of interrupts it with a thunderstorm. And then after the thunderstorm, you know, comes the night, and everything is calm. Really, these three pieces... Uh, watching it, it kind of, I wouldn't say it really represents, like, what they're trying to do, but it's very entertaining. The music does sort of go along with it, so I would consider that one, that that one works. Uh, next, oh goodness, is Dance of Hours of the Dance of the Hours from the opera La Gorconda by Amilcare uh, <laughs> Poncelli, I think. And the time period is around the Romantic era. In this one, it's a ballet performed by ostriches, hippos, elephants, and alligators. Fun fact, the elephant part was actually supposed to be part of Dumbo, that weird little trick scene. And the weird little trip scene was actually supposed to be in Fantasia. But, um, I think it works. It's a little odd, but it works. Um, with the way that the music plays, uh, it really does feel like a ballet. And you can see, like, the different movements, the different techniques. So I think that one works, but it's still weird. <laughs> Next! <laughs> Uh, one of my favorite parts, as you might be able to tell, is The Night on Bald Mountain by uh, Modus Mazorski. Sorry. And it was during the Romantic Era. It is where Chernobog shows up, my favorite Disney villain. Him and his demons kind of, like, come out of the mountain, which you can see here, and fly through the night around the mountain, creating havoc and whatnot. Uh, really, the music, I feel, portrays this very well, uh, how dramatic it really is, and really, it's kind of odd. Like, it kind of comes out of nowhere, really. You're not really expecting to 
get this horrifying uh, charcoal painted scene, but uh, when you listen to the song itself, it really is representing of Chitterbug. <laughs> and then last but not least, the final bit is called Ave Maria, um, OP52, number six by Franz Schubert. This was made kind of late classical, early romantic era. And it's when Chernobyl returns to the mountain and kind of a new dawn begins and we watch the saints walk through uh, the woods with their lights and it's a very beautiful scene, kind of like the calm after the storm. And I think Ava Maria is just the perfect piece to end uh, Fantasia, especially with it being something that is visual where it um, but overall, it just shows that classical music can have uh, other meanings other than just some music playing. Uh, some of it kind of didn't work, but a lot of it I feel really did show that classical music can be interpreted into so much more than maybe what it already stands for or than just, like I said, music on a sheet. So I hope you guys have learned a lot and I thank you for listening. Have a good day.